Bugatti Veyron is a wonderful car. <laughs> 16 cylinders, quad turbo, 1,001 horsepower. It can go 0 to 60 in 2.4 seconds and has a top speed of 253 miles an hour, which is Albuquerque to Santa Fe in about eight minutes. <laughs> <laughs> and it only costs $1.7 million. Problem is, it's so overpowered that the buyers typically crash it within about an hour, <laughs> imposing very high insurance rates upon themselves and serious risks of injury or death to other drivers, cyclists, pedestrians, etc. The Bugatti Veyron, for me, is a pretty good symbol of the global economy in general. Um, and it's the sort of product that we have to understand if we're going to address some of the environmental concerns that are often raised at TED Talks. Now, there was a very good idea from Thorsten Veblen, 1899, in his book, Theory of the Leisure Class, one of the best satirical reads ever, by the way, where Veblen pointed out that conspicuous consumption of this sort uh, may be a way for the rich to display their elite wealth and taste. If that's true, it's sort of bad news, because it means if there's a deep human instinct for displaying elite wealth and taste, it's going to be hard to shift the way that people do their consumption. For me as an evolutionary psychologist, though, the interesting thing to note about the Veblen idea is that in prehistory, when our ancestors were evolving, there were no elites. There was no such thing as wealth. We've had 85 million years evolving as primates, 35 million years as social apes, about 2 million years living as hunter-gatherers in small groups, with kin, friends, family, raising kids, hunting game animals, uh, finding berries, nuts, fruits, tubers, etc. Um, but only in the last 10,000 years with civilization do you have social classes, money, long distance trade, um, the inheritance of status, and any possibility of advertising elite wealth or taste. So I thought, let's back up from the Veblen idea of conspicuous consumption and ask what is it that people are actually trying to do with their consumption patterns. Uh, in my day job as an evolutionary psychologist, I try to understand this chain of causality. What happened in prehistory? What were the challenges of survival, reproduction, socializing, and parenting that shaped human instincts and human preferences? What kind of legacy did that evolution leave in our DNA? How does that construct the human brain? And how does the human brain, when it finds itself in a world of money and marketing, how does it behave? There's an emerging field now of evolutionary consumer psychology that applies these insights about human nature to try to understand conspicuous consumption. I think there are three different kinds of products that are important to understand if you're a consumer or a business person or you're in marketing or advertising or you're simply interested in environmental problems or social policy. There's one class of products that I call survival commodities, things like meat, wood, border collies, if you're a sheep herder, things that are actually useful for survival. The problem with survival commodities from the viewpoint of a business person is there's no profit in them. A commodity, by definition, is something that's valued purely for utility and where competition among firms leads its price to be driven down so the profit margins are typically under 3%. If you want to make a profit in business, you have to have a premium. And there are two kinds of premiums you can offer to the consumer. A pleasure premium, where you say, this Ghirardelli chocolate will lead you to have an orgasm face. Because the pleasure <laughs> is so intense. Products like chocolate, porno, romance novels, um, massages are typically private vices, and consumers don't advertise typically to others the fact that they enjoy these private vices. So pleasure premiums can apply to certain products, but not most products. The real money is in things that have a display premium. Things like the BMW, the Bugatti, anything that's branded clothing, anything that has a premium brand label on it. That's where the money is. That's where it's hard for a rival company to copy your success and to simply produce the same commodity. 
that's where the money is displayed. So I think consumption on the model of hunter gatherer ingesting food is the wrong way to talk about most consumption. I think display is more useful. Display is more useful because it, under, it helps us understand why human animals and other animals invest so much time, energy, money, calories, and risk in showing their nature to others. Here's a female superb bird of paradise inspecting a male superb bird of paradise. The uh, sexual choices made by her female ancestors have shaped the males of the species to become big psychedelic smiley faces. <laughs> they're no longer even recognizable as birds when they're displayed. And that is the power of consumer choice in her case. Right? <laughs> Female brains drive evolution. <laughs> they drive what males become, what males try to display. And in our species, where display by both sexes is important, they drive an awful lot of human behavior. Why do animals display? There are basically three big reasons. Uh, one is to attract mates. Animals can do this through morphological displays, body traits, ornaments like the superb bird of paradise, like the peacock's tail. But animals also do display to attract mates through their behavior. The nightingale has a song repertoire of over a thousand songs that he, that he sings to attract female nightingales. The bower bird builds incredible, symmetric, highly ornamented bowers to attract females. The females fly around, inspect bowers, tear apart the bowers they don't like, get the sperm from the preferred males, and then go off and lay their eggs in their own small and conspicuous camouflage nests. <laughs> There's no function to the male bower nest other than display. We also use display to deter rivals. The extinct Irish elk, the huge canines of many apes, the big upper body muscles of certain movie stars who never use steroids at all. Um, <laughs> Those are all to deter sexual rivals, to chase them off. Also, the young of many species have displays to impress parents, to solicit parental investment, to say, I'm a better, healthier, bigger baby bird than my loser siblings, so you'll be the one. Uh, the bright uh, fur coloration of many young primates that becomes less conspicuous later, that's a, an advertisement of health and ability to resist infection. And any human child saying, hey, mom, look at me, that's a behavioral display that they're doing. So animals display health, genetic quality, parasite resistance, capacity for foraging to get the energy that they invest in displays. What do humans advertise behaviorally? I think there are six central mental traits that humans have deep instincts to display, albeit unconsciously. One of the central six is general intelligence. What you're using now, I hope you understand me. The other five <laughs> mental traits are the so-called big five personality traits. The personality psychologists understand now explain a lot of the differences between individuals. These traits are openness, conscientiousness, agreeableness, emotional stability, and extroversion. All six of these traits are notable. Because A, they're ancient across species. You can actually find evidence for variation in intelligence and agreeableness in all of the other great apes. Chimpanzees, bonobos, gorillas, orangutans. You can even find differences in extroversion versus introversion in squid. So variation in these traits is ancient evolutionarily. There's a lot of evidence now that uh, these traits are all genetically heritable. You resemble your parents largely because of the genes you got from them, not because of your family upbringing. These traits are all stable across the life. If you are highly open at age 20, you'll be highly open at age 80. Not quite as open, but compared to your peers, highly open. Uh, these traits can all be found in many different cultures. The big five exist everywhere in the world. They're all attractive socially and sexually. They can be judged accurately from just a few minutes of face-to-face -face contact.
conversation, or just a few minutes of doing a questionnaire or survey in the psychology lab. Intelligence. This is very important. People make a big deal out of it. It's not really that big a deal. It's simply the most important individual differences variable ever found. There are many different aspects to it, different facets, verbal, spatial intelligence, social, emotional, mating intelligence, all sorts of things. Um, it's easy to see that people advertise this. The last few years, I've been going around Albuquerque before I wrote my book, Spent, paying attention to the bumper stickers that are on the backs of cars. Albuquerque's great because we have a lot of bumper stickers, <laughs> particularly in Knox. And what you'll find often is bumper stickers advertising one or more of these central six traits. For example, uh, just Stanford, right, or Columbia, Harvard, or a PBS mind in a Fox News world. That's basically saying I'm brighter than most other Fox News listeners. Uh -huh. Or Sanat Pailulum Lingwai Latin Idigo. Sure, I speak a little Latin. Right? <laughs> there are only a few high schools in Albuquerque that teach Latin. So this is basically a way of saying, I went to one of those high schools like Albuquerque Academy. The bumper stickers that advertise low intelligence typically do so in a self-derogatory, humorous way. My TV is good in the books, mommy says I'm special. The way that intelligence displays play out in marketing is fascinating. A lot of the branding is associated with educational credentialism, like the Stanford sweatshirt. All the products that have the prefix smart, smart car, smart water, smart food, etc. It's a way of saying I'm smart. And the feature creep, the accumulation of new technologically confusing features in smartphones, for example, <laughs> things you don't really need. Uh, these are also ways of displaying your intelligence. Another major personality trait is openness. If you're here at TED, you're highly open. If you're down the hall at the sort of golf alternative sexuality meeting or whatever it is, you know, I um, different facets of openness include novelty, capacity for fantasy, interest in aesthetics, political liberalism goes very closely with openness, and cosmopolitanism or an interest in global issues as opposed to local parochial issues. A lot of bumper stickers advertise high openness. I like it sloppy and weird, and more freedom. But the funny thing about the personality traits here is that people assortatively socialize. If you're high openness, you want high openness friends and mates. But if you're low openness, you want low openness friends and mates. So you want your bumper stickers to sort out other people. <laughs> so a low openness bumper sticker is like, if God didn't want us to eat animals, he wouldn't have made them out of meat. <laughs> Gun control means using both hands. Now, marketers almost never measure any of these big five personality traits. They use totally discredited 60-year-old systems like the Myers-Briggs personality inventory. Anybody who uses this run a thousand miles the other way because they don't know what they're doing. Um, but openness is very important if you're marketing to early adopters, anybody who's interested in things that are new and different. Uh, the people who buy foreign cars, like the Hyundai Genesis, anything that looks weird with, with strange paint jobs from an untested company, uh, that's attractive to the highly open, it's repulsive to the low openness John owners. And openness is great for marketing because the highly open but only moderately intelligent are highly gullible. So you can sell them anything that's new, anything that's branded alternative, alternative rock, alternative medicine, alternative education, anything, you can, you can make a big problem. Um, another important personality trait, conscientiousness, your capacity to plan for the future, to live up to your promises, your ambition, your interest in order. Uh, there's some bumper stickers that advertise high conscientiousness, but not, not that many, because it's not that funny. Right? The highly conscientious are the sort of puritanical joy killers. Jesus <laughs> used this term signals. The low conscientiousness, the, the impulsive, the free spirits, that's a lot more fun. The people with bumper stickers like oral sex is always a great last minute gift idea. <laughs> um, con 
conscientiousness is relevant in marketing when you're selling exercise machines. The profit here is selling exercise machines to people who overestimate their conscientiousness. Who <laughs> think, yes, I'll use it every day. And then it gathers dust in the corner. The people who buy high maintenance pets and then groom the hell out of them. <laughs> right, and make their poodle look like a garden. <laughs> and the most important index of conscientiousness in the modern economy is your credit score. What allows you to buy a house or a car on credit? That is basically an index of paying bills on time, planning ahead, not being unemployed, staying in the same place. It's a conscientiousness indicator. Okay, I could go through a lot more stuff about the different big five traits and how they uh, relate to marketing. I'll just in passing say agreeableness is also really important because the highly agreeable, the kind, the altruistic are the ones who buy more gifts for others and are happier about it. They're the people who care about the world and the environment, right, and, and take into account the welfare of future generations and others and other animals and, and the planet itself. And they're the people who typically do more conspicuous charity rather than conspicuous consumption. It's all conspicuous, but that's okay. Charity's better than What's happening now is the standard game of life, the route to success that my grandparents tried to instill in my parents and me, is this flowchart, right? You go from genetic quality, how good your genes are, having a low mutation load that allows you to build a good brain that's not weird and different and, and maladaptive. That's a major determinant in your general intelligence. How do you display intelligence? Through the service industry called higher education. You get educational credentials, which are basically intelligence tests. And it's very important for professors like me to try to discredit intelligence tests because they're much more accurate at revealing intelligence than educational credentials, but they're much cheaper and they only take an hour. <laughs> Four years. So you get your educational credential that allows you to enter a profession, skilled employment, you make a higher income, you, you can do conspicuous consumption, you buy the Bugatti Veyron, and then finally at the age of 60 or something, you can attract mates and friends. <laughs> What's happening now is my students, age 20, have discovered there's a, there's a workaround. <laughs> There's a secret way using the internet that you can display your intelligence or your other personality traits directly to potential mates and friends without doing all this stuff. <laughs> and we people in, 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 who have vested interest in this system are panicked. <laughs> because, we, oh my god, the, the, whole, the sky will fall if these people figure out they can display these central six traits without doing all this rigmarole. And the instinct there is for the display of the traits. It's not, as Bevelin said, to display weak wealth and status. So, that gives us some leverage in social and economic policy to think about how can we allow people to use their display instincts to show off these central six traits without necessarily imposing such a huge uh, ecological footprint on the planet. And I think the $64,000 question for the future is the developing economies now, particularly the mega economies of China, 1.3 billion people in India, 1.1 billion people, what systems of trade display will their young people adopt? Will they adopt the conspicuous consumption system that we're trying to sell them? Or will they think, no, actually, my personal happiness index is more important. And that will depend on how efficiently I can display my central six traits to others. And it doesn't necessarily have to be through consumption. So uh, the drive now in China and India to, to develop ecologically sustainable cities and to try not to center them upon shopping, but to center them upon families, communities, education, informal social interaction, <coughs> social capital. 
That's basically a way of trying to find an alternative display system. Uh, and I think the more imaginative we can be about that, the better we understand the display instincts, the better the world will be. Thanks.